Ash away. Oh, that's a good guy. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. I'm Robert Earl. And if you're seeing this introduction, you're watching one of the videos that we're going to be using out here as a um, part of the Eco Ranch Sustainable Living Education Center. Wow, that's a big old fancy name. Couldn't come up with an acronym for it, so it's the Eco Ranch Sustainable Living Educational F Center. What that means, though, is that the video is going to be long. It's going to be jam-packed with information. So if you're a kitten in a teacup guy and you don't see that kitten in a teacup in 10 seconds, you're off and gone, turn it off right now. But if you're somebody that's looking for information, want to truly learn about sustainable living and how you can improve what we're doing to the planet or what we're not doing to the planet, go get yourself a pad of paper and a pencil or get your tablet take some notes because this video is going to be loaded with a whole lot of information and not just this video but every video that comes after it. Now as a part of being a sustainable living education center we're always going to be in need of money. Right now we need to build with Portland cement and there's going to be more and more things coming up so we'll always always uh, be happy to accept any donations and if you feel that you've gotten any information out of these videos and you have the ability make a small donation to help us get that Portland to make more videos and make this place a better sustainable living education center I'll go ahead and put the link in the comments and also on the main page of the Eco Ranch um, YouTube channel right up here on the main page is a donate button. So without further ado, let's go into the actual video. <laughs> boy, oh boy, the star of the show, Cascade the Wonder Dog, yay. Hi everybody, he's wandering off to do well. I wonder what, that's maybe why we call him the Wonder Dog. But I'm here and I'm Robert Earl at the Eco Ranch in far west Texas. Let's talk about chickens. Let's talk about meat chickens specifically. Now that's going to be a touchy subject for some folks, uh, especially those who have made the, the choice for whatever reason, whether it be for this week or for life, to not eat meat. And also those that do eat meat that are concerned about how um, humanely animals are treated. So we're going to cover some of that and a lot of how I'm raising our meat chickens this year in this video so why don't we get started so there's going to be a lot of information maybe not quite a lot of visual um visual uh, eye candy in this but it's the information that's important now first of all <clears throat> as i started the journey with these meat chickens this year uh, i did not start this video as i should have so to see how i began with the meat chickens you'll need to go back to our um our uh, video, our vlog for the end of May, and you'll see the meat chickens in what I've built here as the nursery. Again, to preface that, I built the nursery to handle 100 to a maximum of 200 meat chickens. Now what I got were 300 because I got a deal from the, the hatchery, which is Country Hatchery in Oklahoma. Um, I'll go into the deal in a minute, but I got a deal on 300, so space is going to be an issue. When you see this, they are going to look crowded now, and of course your next, your first thought's going to be, oh my God, what's going to happen in a little while? In a little while, the area that I'm sitting in right here is going to be boxed in to give them extra room. It'll increase the, the, the space they have by over 50% which will roughly give me the same square footage. It's not going to give me the square footage that some folks would like to see. And that's why, that's one of the things I want to go into in this video, because not all of us live in an ideal place for pasturing, pasturing chickens. Not all of us live in a place where we can, um, we can provide a lot more space. And a lot of us don't want to provide a lot of space for meat chickens. The reason is when you have meat chickens that move around too much, now Cornish crosses, uh, Cornish roasters, the Frankenbirds, they don't move around much. They kind of sort of position themselves by the feeder and the waterer, and so they eat, they drink, they crap. They eat, they drink, they crap. That's all they do. They don't move around much. But when you get into other breeds that, that um, are going to move because they're going to forage, they're going to live a normal life unlike the Frankenbirds, 
They want to move. They want to get around. Well, the more they walk on those legs, the more they exercise their wings. I'm not doing the chicken dance. Um, the tougher the meat gets, even in a 12 to 16 week old bird. So, so the degree of confinement, the amount of space you give your birds is going to depend on your, I hate to use this word, on your morality. You want to give them a lot of space, you want to give them a little. In my case, I'm swallowing hard and not giving them a lot of space. So trolls, don't bother telling me, I know. These birds are going to live the way you're seeing them with about the same space for 12 to 16 weeks. And I'm not sure because we're watching them weight gain and we're going to get into that next as we talk about feed. So, this video is going to be the longest of the series of three or four videos. I'm not sure whether we're going to do three or four because I'm not sure how fast these birds are going to grow. Which, well, wait a minute, the guy's supposed to be an expert, but he doesn't know how, how fast the birds are going to grow? I don't know. We're going to get into that first. We're going to talk about two things in this video. Number one is going to be the chickens, and number two is going to be the feed. So let's talk about the chickens and why I am not sure that they're, how long they're going to take. Because there's a lot of people out there, just watched several videos why I waited for the battery to charge, where these folks were saying, oh, well, in six weeks you have a finished bird. Well, that's fine. Here's the thing. They're talking about the birds called Cornish Cross or Cornish Roasters, uh, the so-called Frankenbirds. Now, there's a lot of people that make a lot of noise about them. Oh, they're Frankenbirds, they're genetic mutations, they're blah, blah. Well, yeah. Look, there is genetic a mutation as, as the corn, the heritage corn, uh, uh, yeah, heritage corn pl plants that we grow are a genetic mutation. Of course, that corn crop was grown from a little tiny grass stalk up to what you see now. It might be eight or nine feet tall. These chickens were grown from the Ansel breed, which is over in Southeast Asia with a breast like this. To give you a Cornish cross, it's got a breast like this. Feed conversion rate. When I talk feed conversion, that means how much feed do you feed to the bird to gain a pound of live bird weight. Not carcass weight, live bird weight. So when you're talking about the Cornish cross, the Frankenbird, which is what I'll call it, just because I kind of like the name Frankenbird. I have no aversion, I have only one aversion to the Frankenbird, and that's cost. Otherwise, great bird. But the Frankenbird is a three to one. That means three pounds of feed go in, one pound of live animal comes out. Excellent. Just about the best you can get. I've seen better than that. I've seen as low as two to one in commercial um, in a commercial um, growing facility. Now you've got antibiotics, steroids, and hormones going on in there. But in terms of just outright weight gain, three to one. Now, I'm not using Cornish Cross, and I said my objection was cost. Yes, that's part of my objection. The Cornish Crosses are going to run you, this year, if you bought from Murray McMurray Hatchery, uh, which I don't deal with them anymore because they've gotten too impersonal. I deal with Country Hatchery, Dr. Dennis Smith in, in Oklahoma. But at Murray McMurray, the Cornish Crosses were anywhere from two and a quarter to two sixty a pound by the time you figured in a pound, excuse me, per bird. Two and a quarter to two sixty per bird um, when you factor in shipping. Now you're paying two sixty to begin with, and then you're putting feed in that. You're going to end up with a bird that's getting a little bit costly. Again, if you're doing ten or fifteen or twenty birds just to go to wow your friends or your family with, not a big deal. There's three kinds of people. There's that guy that's going to want to wow his friends or impress their neighbors or the local soccer moms or the other soccer moms with, oh yes, we've got these wonderful delicious eggs and we've got this wonderful chicken. Oh well, yeah, the eggs cost you eight dollars a pound. The chicken costs you eight dollars a pound but it doesn't matter because you don't care that's not your goal then there's the group that I would say most of you that would watch this fall into and that's the ones that really want to feed your family you don't mind paying a little more for quality no hormone steroids or antibiotics you don't mind paying a little more but you don't want to pay any more and you have to then there's a guy like me I'm growing a year's worth of chickens right here right now this will feed Debbie and I for a year and I also sell a few. Now, 
it's illegal based on Texas laws. You know, Texas legislators can be bought cheaper than the legislators in any state in the union, so agribusiness has got them all in their pockets. Um, it's technically Ill illegal, but we work out a different kind of barter system. But anyway, I fall into that group. So cost is very important to me. So I can't afford two and a quarter a pound, or two fifty a bird, I should say. Uh, and I need to grow them up as quick as I can. Now I've got an incubator, but I can only put fifty eggs in the incubator at a time. You put fifty eggs in the incubator, you might get thirty-five birds of those thirty-five, eighteen, again, generally speaking. 18 are roosters that I want to eat, 17 are hens that I'll probably want to um, use, use to replace my hens that are aging. Already did that this year. I ran, uh, I ran two sets of, um, uh, of eggs through the incubator and I got some roosters which have already processed. I've got some hens that will be laying in a couple of months. So I went here to something called the frying pan special. McMurray Hatchery has them, Country Hatchery, everybody has them. And here's why. Uh, in, in birds and mammals, 51% of the hatch is always going to be male. Male ensures the survival of the species. And you've got higher mortality in males because they generally are doing what? They're protecting their, their woman, their women, their harem. They're women, whatever. That's why the cave men went out and they killed something and dragged it home, and the women stayed in the cave and cooked it. In roosters and or in chickens, rather, the roosters they're like this, constantly guarding those hens. So nature has given us 51% male. That's great, except that only 5% of the people out there or less want roosters. So what do the hatcheries do with all these roosters? 51% of the hatch is roosters. Well, they die a gruesome death. They either get ground up live, they get, they get smashed against a wall. Use your imagination because it all probably happens. Been inside the business and seen it. So my thinking here was, I don't really want to pay the cost for the frankenbirds because it gets a little cost prohibitive for me. And I'd like to utilize a resource that isn't being utilized. For example, those excess roosters that were about to get ground up. Now they're going to die anyway, but at least they get a shot at being alive and they're going to feed the family. So we went with the frying pan special, which was like five or six different breeds. They're going to give me a breast like this. They're not going to give me a Cornish cross breast, but they aren't going to drop dead of a heart attack if I let them live past four months like the Cornish crosses do. Or some people call it flip over. It's the same thing. They have a heart attack, they flip over and they die. They die because they've grown so fast the organs, particularly the heart, can't keep up and they just die. It's an unnatural bird. So we're utilizing this resource of extra roosters that we're going to go to waste anyway or get killed anyway. We're going to grow them up as birds, as meat chickens. That's why I don't know exactly how long it's going to take. So I'm anticipating three. That'll be this one, which is the May, June, July, and then August. I may have to stretch that into September. Now, if I'm, I'm holding up four fingers here, four times four is 16 weeks. Already, that's quite a bit beyond the Frankenbirds. Uh, Frankenbirds generally, they'll tell you eight weeks, six to eight weeks all day long. That guy's pulling your leg. It's going to be closer to 10 weeks to get a decent sized carcass, a six, seven pound carcass, which when they grow that fast, you really want to get it up there. Now, your feed. Uh, uh, your feed conversion drops from three to one to closer to four and a half to one when you do that. Now I've done the math right now and I'm not going to get too deep into it, but at this point these birds are running five and a half to one at this point. Uh, they generally do grow a little slower. They're in the time right now when they're going to spurt and grow a lot faster. I'm anticipating though that I'm going to be somewhere in the five to one ratio on these birds. So five and a half to one is not too far off. So that's the story of the birds. They're behind me dancing around and talking to each other. Kind of calm right now. It's 106 degrees here. Now, what you do for a bird is going to be up to you. Do you go with the Frankenbird? Do you hatch your own? Do you, um, do you buy roosters from a hatchery? Entirely up to you. How you do it, how you raise it, there are some different, re uh, different ways. The way I'm doing it here works the best for me, but remember I'm in the desert. It's going to work the best for us in this situation. Behind me is the nursery. 
in the nursery are the birds. Now the nursery is about eight feet wide by uh, 20 feet deep. We're going to expand it another 10 feet by eight feet. So we'll essentially create a, uh, increase, uh, increase it by 50%. That's all the space these birds are going to get. Now, if you're, you're already looking behind me, they are crowded, and they're crowded for a reason, and that reason is really a, a, a very simple reason economically. If, if they move too much, if they get to run around and walk around too much, they will. They're going to exercise. When they exercise, the meat's going to get a little tougher. That means you've got to kill them at a smaller weight, kill them younger, and the meat might still be tough, but if you let them grow up to 16 weeks, unless it's a frankenbird, it is going to be tough. The legs, the thighs, the wings are going to be a little tougher. Maybe tough, too tough for you to want to eat or your family to want to eat. So when you get a tough bird, like what happens when you have a spent hen uh, or an older rooster that you kill, what we do here is we take the breast meat, which is always good, and you can always pound it a little bit to tenderize it. Take the breast meat off, we take the wings, and we save the wings for fricassee. I like hot wings, but these wings here, the only thing's going to get hot to your temper doing that, trying to eat one. I save the wings for fricassee. I take and strip all the meat off of the legs and thighs and grind that up into ground chicken. Now it's not tough anymore. And then that little piece of meat that's right around the breast, uh, the wishbone. That little piece of meat, I save that and the wishbone to make my hot wings out of. Uh, that's all you can do when they get overly tough. So I can find the birds here primarily so they don't get a lot of exercise, so they don't get tough. Yeah, you're running into an area that some folks could find ethical or ethical issues with. And that brings up an important point I'm just going to touch on briefly. You've got ethics on one side, you've got what would work in a perfect world here, and then you've got the world over here. So what would work in the perfect world if you applied it probably wouldn't feed 350 million Americans or 7.5 billion people on the planet. So at some point we have to do stuff that's a little distasteful in order to feed all the people in the urban areas. In my case, I want I want to have the tender birds, and I want my feed to weight gain conversion as low as possible. So I'm opting for this. The birds will appear as they age, as we go through these next videos, they will appear about as crowded as they are now as they grow, because the space is about to increase, and they'll fill the space. So. I think that pretty much covers everything I want to cover in the birds. However, remember folks, you can always email me and ask me a question. I'm happy to answer the uh, email address. I'm not going to bother giving it here. I'll put it in the, um, I'll put it in the uh, comment section below. Uh, so we're going to move on to feed. And feed is probably one of the most important things we can discuss right now. And feed is something I've spent a lot of time on and become somewhat of an expert on. Uh, in fact, my feed mix, I've done the two videos on my secret feed mix. It's currently being used in 18 countries throughout the world, but I think the, the greatest achievement, I believe, probably in my entire lifetime, is what we did in Cambodia. And one village in Cambodia happened to be a Muslim village. They reached out to me because... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I really can't tell you. But they reached out to me, and probably the fact that they were a Muslim village doesn't matter at all. But, reached out to me, they were telling me that um, they weren't getting the weight gain they wanted, and they were having 90 plus percent mortality from HPAI, that's highly pathogenic avian influenza, better known as bird flu. Bird flu would roar through, and believe me, bird flu is still bird flu is still roaring through Asia. You just don't hear about it because the fashion of the day has moved on to something else. We got we have someone in a high political position in this country right now that is getting all the attention, and things like bird flu that are really important in the world are taking a second, a backseat to this guy. But bird flu is there, it's an ever-present problem, and 90 plus percent mortality was a real issue. Put these guys on my feed mix, didn't hear from them for a year, and then I heard, you won't believe it, 
I mean, actually, the phone rings. Hello, Mr. Robert, Mr. Robert. You know it's somebody from overseas when they do that. Talk to them. Bird flu came through. All the villages in their area were decimated. Everybody, 90 plus percent mortality except one village. This village. Their survival rate was over 90 percent. In other words, a complete 180 turnaround. What was the difference? My feed mix. No, my feed mix isn't fantastic, doesn't have secret ingredients. It's a real simple thing. You, you've been out there looking at feed mixes from the, the checkerboard people and everyone else. You think that your laying hens need 16%. In fact, we got a whole bunch of dummies around here that think, oh, 7% scratch is fine, and they're getting eggs out of their birds. They just aren't getting eggs like mine. 16% is fine, 7% is fine. Well, it's like, it, 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 it's like, I hate to say something like this, but it's the only way I can draw you a picture. It's like those pictures you, you saw of the Auschwitz death camp, how thin and skinny those people were coming out of there. You feed them that kind of feed, you're creating a bird like that. Those poor people that were in there, if the flu came through, they were going to die because they had no resistance, they had no body fat, no energy reserves in their body. Chickens are the same way. You create a death camp over here with 16% protein or less, 15, some people are feeding, and they'd have no fat reserves for when bird flu or anything comes through. Anything comes through, even a cold snap, they don't have the ability to fight it off, they don't have the ability to resist it, so what do they do? They drop dead. What happened in Cambodia? Something real simple. They were feeding about 15%. I said, guys, swallow hard, spend the money up front, increase your protein to 20% plus. 20% is the minimum. Go above that. It'll reward you in terms of better egg quality, increased egg production. The birds will grow to maturity faster. And the biggie, when bird flu comes calling, not so many birds are going to answer the call. That's what happened. Very proud of that. And it's a simple thing you'll never hear from the checkerboard people or Joe the expert at Homesteads are us. We're cute little people with the homestead. Come and watch us now. They won't tell you because they don't know. I know because I, I don't have time to do that cutesy stuff and a little happy dance or have the funky long beard or any of the, any of the catchy things they do other than the pink shirt. All I'm going to do is tell you the way it is. The truth as I've seen it, as I've experienced it over the last 20 years. 20% 20 protein is a bare minimum. Raise your babies on 28% if possible. We're at 25 here, and I'm going to get into that right now. So I mentioned the checkerboard people. I don't want to mention them by name because they've probably got a whole staff of lawyers on people. In fact, I should call them chessboard people. This is a bad group to deal with. Any big corporation that's selling you animal feed, they are a bad thing to deal with. And I'm gonna tell you why right now. You see, they answer to one, one God only. And that God is a stockholder. Stockholder wants a profit, they gotta find a way to make more profit. And believe me, they may be in the animal business, the last thing they care about is your animal. They want that profit margin as high as possible. So they're doing things that are cut to cut corners on the profit margin. Now I'm going to tell you something that sounds a little innocuous here. They take the whole kernel of corn and the whole kernel of soy, if they're using which they're using soy as their protein booster. They're cracking that kernel, they're removing the germ. The germ's where all the oil is, the germ's where the energy is. They're removing most of the germ from your corn kernel, from your soy, from your grains. And they're using it somewhere else, generally in some human food, or generally for something you might be familiar with called um, high fructose corn syrup. They're taking that away. Now they don't care because the labels, these labels right here, they only have to tell you crude protein. Now you don't know what crude protein is. Yeah, protein's protein, no. That's what they want you to believe, and that's why they lobbied to get the word crude put on there. If it said digestible protein, you'd go, ooh, wait a minute. Crude protein is different. So they take away the, good, the goodness of the corn kernel in that germ, 
and they put it in Coca-Cola. Oop, I mentioned the product. They put it in that, which, of course, we all know high fructose corn syrup is the number one trigger for adult onset diabetes. Eliminate that from your diet, bang. You've eliminated a very big risk on, um, on adult onset diabetes. But I digress. Crude protein. So you're buying something that's 16% crude protein or 18% from the checkerboard people. It's crude protein. Crude protein is anything that is identifiable as protein. And I'm looking around here for a feather. You'd think, there we go. This, my friends, is crude protein. You do an analysis of it, it's going to come up as, I don't know the exact percentage, but let's say 90% protein. It's not digestible, but it's protein. What little hair I have left on my head, that's crude protein. You can't eat it. You know why I know you can't eat it? Because I've been out in the bush a long, long time. Last, God, for 60 years I've been out in the bush, and every time I see bear poop or coyote poop or wolf poop, or any kind of predator poop, you know what it's loaded with? You've all seen it too, say it with me. Hair and feathers, undigestible. But it qualifies as crude protein. So you grind it up and you put it in this bag and guess what? You can raise that number of crude protein. Not digestible protein. You'd be shocked if you knew the actual percentage of digestible protein, but that actual percentage, somewhere in the 10 to 12% range. And then people wonder, we wondered, we wondered at Calmain why um, Campbell's Soup canceled their contract with us. We had a contract. When our hens were spent at 18 months, their first molt, we'd sell them to Campbell's Soup and they'd make chicken noodle soup out of it. And you all know you get half a teaspoon of, of chicken meat in Campbell's Chicken Noodle Soup. They quit buying from us because they couldn't get any meat off of our birds. They were that spent. They would have looked at Auschwitz as, uh, as Boca Raton, Florida. That's how starved they were. You want digestible protein. You don't want somebody that splits out the germ and pulls that germ out. Now you also want, don't want, somebody that's gone through a cold extrusion process. You'd think, oh, cold extrusion, wait a minute, oh, that's saving all the important vitamins and minerals and you're not heating it up. I guess they're not heating it up because it's cold. So we'll go with cold extrusion. Well, yeah, cold extrusion uses inert binders. The biggest one they use is something that's mined all around me here in West Texas. Bentonite clay, food grade bentonite. Food grade bentonite clay. You get it wet, you mix it with the ground, um, the ground grains. It gets real nice and sticky. You run it through the pasta maker, which is all that extruding machine is. Run it through that little pasta maker and chop, 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 out it comes. You got the little things, they dry up. Beautiful. You've got pellets. And 15% bentonite clay that's totally undigestible, but they don't charge you for the bentonite clay. They're charging you their high dollar per pound for the checkerboard fancy mix of crapolina fee. You're paying top dollar for clay or another inert binder that's even worse than that. The clay's the number one that's used. Cold extrusion is bad, and they use it. What's better? Hot extrusion. Very simple. They heat up the corn, not to the point where they cook it and lose nutritional value, just until the gluten gets nice and sticky. Mix everything together, run it through the extruder, no binders. Oh, but wait a minute, it costs a lot of money to heat that stuff up. Our stockholders wouldn't like that, so let's just make this chess move here. Hey, they're number one because you buy from them, not because I buy from them. You have the power to vote, not only go and vote physically, but vote with your pocketbook. And you voted with your pocketbook, and you like, you say, checkerboard people, feed us crap. But I'm telling you the way it is. Now, I picked up this bag two or three times. I've gone to several mills here in West Texas, and if there is a mill that I haven't been to, and you're doing what I've said, you're doing the things right that I'm saying, I apologize for not mentioning you. I found two. One is Bryant Feeds here, and they're in Alita, Alita, Texas, Alito, Texas. And the other one is, um, I, I buy from both of these um, mills, but I buy through my local feed stores. 
The other one is Angelo Feeds out of San Angelo, Texas. And Angelo is the sister to another company there, and I can't remember their name. They use the entire kernel. They don't split it. Use a cold extrusion process. And there's nothing wrong with their feed. All I have to do is kick up that protein a little bit because this, uh, not this, but the, what I feed my adult birds is only 17% uh, protein. I gotta kick it up over 20. This is 22%, what I just showed you. This is the uh, Bryant uh, Chick Starter. It's 22%, and I have to kick it up a little bit from there. Um, and it becomes a matter of cost. The uh, ticker board people here, um, and again, it's going to vary from region to region, but I understand we're not too far off from some parts of the Northeast. The checkerboard people, their chick starter is going to have medication in it that I don't want, simply because we don't have a coccidiosis risk here because we don't jam them that close together. But um, they're gonna, it's going to be medicated. I don't want medication primarily because I have waterfowl here, and that medication is toxic to waterfowl if they happen to get in and eat some of it. But um, the big thing is the cost. The checkerboard chick starter is over $20 a bag. And if I buy another brand that they carry that's a, that's a checkerboard-owned uh, company of uh, Game Starter, Game Bird Starter, it's going to cost me $22.50 a bag. This stuff here is expensive enough. It's pricey enough. I pay $17 a bag. Best price I can get around here. But... All I have to do is augment it slightly. And here's the thing, the augmentation can be whatever you want to do. If you're, um, if you're pasturing your birds, number one, you should have turned this off a long time ago because you can pasture your birds and you don't have to worry about this. But if you don't have the ability to pasture due to space or the fact that you're in a desert, I have maggot traps that I'm using that feeds most of my birds. I'm not using a maggot trap here because of the smell. Uh, maggot traps are in one of my videos. Look it up. Also look up other people's videos. There's a whole bunch on YouTube that have done a great job with maggot traps. Maggot trap is a magical thing to use. You can use a mealworm farm. Right now we're not, but we're going to go back to it. We just simply don't have enough time to maintain the, the uh, mealworm farm. Uh, but the maggot traps work great. What we are doing though is in, for augmenting, because we can't pasture, we are sprouting seeds. We're creating our own little pasture. And what we're doing is we're sprouting both millet and milo. Now for right now, millet seems to sprout faster. Milo is half the price, but millet sprouts in just about half the time, so it almost balances out. We sprout millet and milo, and we raise the uh, millet and milo up, and I'm going to show you. Move my chair out of the way. This tray could go another day or two. This tray is Milo, uh, and it really didn't grow all that slowly, but it could go another day or two. Now they're already, notice how quiet they are, look at their eyes over my shoulder. They are looking, they see this. Let's give it to them, see what they think of it. This is picking up the protein, giving them vitamins and minerals, and also keeping them busy. Giving them something to do, because it's pretty crowded in here. Pretty boring. Whoa, they're jumping right on it. Give it about 20 seconds, you won't be able to see it. Oh, try 10. Now, I also had one of our area residents. Um, uh, gave me a hundred pounds of quinoa that uh, I've been feeding them. Now quinoa has a coating on it that has kind of a soapy flavor that really puts off birds particularly. So quinoa's got to be soaked. Uh, one, and, and also that soapy coating is slightly toxic and we'd be dealing with small birds. Uh, I weighed these guys, four or five of them, I weighed them uh, a few days ago and they were 12 ounces. Uh, that's how I came up with that 5.5 .5 to 1 for my, my um, feed to weight gain. But um, it, it's slight toxicity. If it doesn't outright kill them, it'll make them sick enough that they won't gain weight. And after all, we're trying to raise them for meat. So we want, we want the economy of um, feed, and we want the economy of motion, and we want general or economy, period. 
So we want to um, we want to not introduce anything that would be toxic or slow the, their digestion any. So we take the quinoa and soak it for 36 hours, changing the water often. And the water that I change, just as an aside, the water that I change out on them, I use that to mix my mortar with. So again, nothing goes to waste. Remember, we're switching over here to a teaching center, the Eco Ranch Sustainable Living Education Center. And one of our mantras, the number one mantra that we use is the three R's, the three R's of sustainability. Recycle, repurpose, and reuse. So when I change the water out, I dump it in buckets that I use to make the mortar with. Just a, just a little aside there. Well, I'll tell you, they sure made short use, short, short work of that. I had to take a half hour to recharge the battery, enough to finish this up, and it is completely gone. They're standing on it looking at me wanting more. We used to call the babies Velociraptors because they looked so much like those little Velociraptors in uh, Jurassic Park. Debbie calls these Velociroosters. I think she's right. Now anyway, so by adding the greens, we've been able to get our protein level up to something that's acceptable for working with these birds here. How fast they grow, we still have to wait and see. We're not going to augment them with anything like um, uh, a maggot trap, which I've done videos on maggot traps, uh, or a the um, mealworm farm because we had to shut the mealworm farm down because we just simply don't have time for it. Uh, and we have the quinoa. If we get some other scraps of some sort that are given to us that are decent scraps, uh, we'll go ahead and feed it to them. But we have a complete diet here with the sprouted milo and millet, and with the uh, animal feed. Again, as I said, the, um, the important thing for the feed is that you're using a whole grain. You're not having that germ chipped away. And I believe I've covered everything to do with feed. That's why I keep looking around. I'm trying to figure out if I've forgotten something. I think I've covered the feed. I've covered the chickens. The only thing now left to do is to wait and see how they gain weight and what goes on. And we won't know that until the next video in this series. Uh, I'm going to urge you, if you've watched this, ask me some questions. I'll put, uh, I'll, if it's of general interest, I'll put it in the next video. In the next video, we're going to talk more about the weight gain, caring for them as they get a little bit older. And um, if you're interested in doing this yourself, well, hey, what's stopping you? Get on the phone right now or get, on, uh, get online right now and order yourself some chickens. I don't recommend McMurray because... They've just gotten too big for their britches, but McMurray is perfectly all right. I didn't have any real trouble with them. If you want to get some birds, go ahead and get yourself the fry pan special. A bunch of roosters from somebody else. Get them, set them up, and uh, join me for the next video. And we'll see, uh, we'll see where we go in the next video with the weight gain and what else I need to show you, which is going to be a lot. I'll have a better outline then. I just wanted to get this out so you guys could see it. Get an idea of where we're going to go, not only with these birds, but with our educational videos and with the education experience that we're going to have available here for people at the Eco Ranch Sustainable Education Living Center. So until next time, out here at the Eco Ranch in far west Texas, it's Robert Earl saying, see you then.